Hello, everyone, and welcome to Arthritis Talks. I'm Dr. Sean Bevan, Chief Science Officer at the Arthritis Society, and thank you for joining us tonight. While we have come together for this event from many different places, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which I am located on, which our Toronto office stands, is the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. Anishinaabek, Huron-Wendat, and Haudenosaunee Indigenous peoples. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek and allied nations to peacefully share and care for their resources around the Great Lakes. Today, this meeting place is home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and I am grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. Today, we are fortunate to welcome Arthritis Society physiotherapist, Lisa Robinson, who is here to answer some of the most common questions we receive about assistive devices for arthritis. Before we get started, a few logistics. This webinar is best viewed on a laptop or desktop computer. If you have technical difficulties, please email arthritistalks at arthritis.ca for assistance. If you have a question for our presenter, you could submit it through the Q&A button at the bottom middle of the screen. And as usual, we will try to get to as many questions as possible during the hour that we have together. You can click on the chat icon in the bottom middle of the screen to access the chat and connect with other participants as well as the Arthritis Society's chat moderator. If you would like to close the chat completely, which I know some of you would, please click the red X icon to close out of the window. We're pleased to continue to provide captioning of our webinars to accommodate the diverse needs of our audience, and you'll see that running along the page. Many questions we received in advance followed similar themes, so we have structured this deck to address those first before going into the live Q&A at the end of the session. Before we get started, I have to thank our event partners, Pfizer, United Way Winnipeg, and others for their financial support of our Arthritis Talk series. So with that, let's get started. And first, a warm welcome to Lisa Robinson. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. So we have received um, some questions from people who are finding that everyday tasks are becoming quite difficult due to their arthritis, but some of them are quite reluctant to use assistive devices. So what would you recommend for them? Sean, thank you for having me. Uh, I would say that that's a good first question to start off with, where um, the, the idea is that initially people even need to get started by accepting or coming to terms with the idea of using assistive devices. And what we would like to get across in this webinar is that assistive devices are really intended to be our friends, not our enemy. Uh, a lot of people, they have a desire to try to push through a task as hard as they can and ignore the pain until they get to a stage where they just really can't physically perform it anymore. Uh, but that type of no pain, no gain method really doesn't work with arthritis. And, and actually pushing through and causing excessive amounts of pain or struggling to cause frustration and anger is really not going to be beneficial. And if anything, it could cause overuse of your joints, which might uh, further progress the damage that is occurring. Sometimes people, they worry that using an assistive device is going to, to make them weaker or make them dependent on that device. But we know that that's really not the case. And the role of an assistive device is to make you more functionally independent, not less. If you, if you were to think of a walker, a rollator walker, a lot of people feel resistant to maybe use this because there's this unfortunate stigma around it that perhaps it's something that, that represents being elderly or being frail. Uh, but really, if you think of a walker as something that if it's able to, to allow you to walk with better posture, a better gait pattern, uh, walk for longer and with less pain, then what that really is is a piece of exercise equipment. And if by not using a walker, if you are not able to walk as far, not able to walk as comfortably, and if you start having to withdraw from social activities uh, and things that you enjoy doing, then what you will see is a gradual decline in your mobility and deconditioning, which we, of course, are all trying to avoid. So I, I think the first thing is really just seeing, um, not seeing an assist device as giving in or being dependent on it, but instead thinking of it as a way that's going to protect your joints and maintain your function and your independence. And fortunately, there's really a ton of different options out there for, for every situation. 
So let's take a look at the first one here. So the, the bathroom, this is an area where often people do uh, have difficulty. Um, there's lots of things that can pose difficulties because you require quite a bit of range of motion in your hips and your knees and adequate strength in your legs to be getting up and down off the toilet or safely stepping over the side of the tub to get into a bath or a shower. Uh, and not everybody is necessarily gonna have a comfort level with those types of tasks. So anytime you can use a raised seat, uh, whether we're talking about a raised toilet toilet seat or a comfort height toilet, which is like a normal toilet, but uh, usually several inches higher, or elsewhere in your home using cushions or furniture risers to raise that surface, it's going to be easier for you to get up and down from that surface uh, and can do it more safely. Uh, similarly, having to get in and out of the, the bathtub or the shower, um, or even if you have a walk-in shower, sometimes just needing to have that grip bar, a safety bar on there, so that you're able to hold on to that and safely enter and exit that, especially with a slippery floor, uh, that's really important. And once you're in the tub or in the shower, it might be that due to pain in your back or in your legs, you might not feel comfortable or confident standing for long periods of time, in which case using a shower chair can be an effective way to still allow you to independently bathe. Uh, you can still sit, wash your hair, bathe yourself uh, without having to have the pain or the risk of a fall that might accompany having to stand for prolonged periods of time. Outside of the bathroom, if we were to, to talk about dressing, uh, this is also an issue which can occur, especially when we're talking about having to maybe bend forward to be able to reach our feet. Uh, again, you need to have a lot of range of motion in your back, your hips and your knees to reach down that far. And sometimes it's also a matter of the amount of dexterity that you have in your hands. So if those are things that are an issue for you, uh, then there are several assisted devices that can be useful. The sock aid is usually either a flexible or a molded piece of plastic where you can, you can put the sock over kind of this tube-like structure. And as we see in the picture, you slide your foot into that tube with the sock, and then it has those straps that you can use to pull the sock up into position around your leg. Once you have that done, um, you then still need to get a shoe on, of course, if you're going out somewhere. A lot of people, they just choose to use slip-on shoes, but that's not always a possibility. If you have a shoe that requires laces, then elastic shoelaces are a nice option. Uh, with elastic shoelaces, once you get your shoe up, done up the first time, make sure that the laces are nice and tight and comfortably supporting your foot. And you can then use a long handled shoehorn to just slide your foot in and out of that shoe. So you don't have to bend over each time and you don't have to have the fine motor skills or the dexterity to be able to do the shoelaces up and undo them each time. In the, the other picture on the slide here with the black handle and the tapered piece of metal, that is called a button hook. So if due to your, your dexterity, your fine motor skills, if doing up small buttons is an issue, then a button hook can be really beneficial. Holding the handle, the tapered piece of metal will go through the button hole, grab the button on the other side and pull it through the hole. And in that sense, you can still wear a button up shirt if you are wanting to. And at the end of it, you'll see there's a little hook and that you can use for grabbing onto a zipper and pulling zippers up and down if that's also a source of difficulty for you. So lots of different options for dressing. And, and finally, um, another consideration is technology. Technology just in general is a big part of our lives nowadays with many people using tablets or smartphones. Um, there's two problems that can often arise from this. The first is if you have arthritis in your neck or in your upper back, where when we're using tablets and smartphones, we know that people have a tendency to have their head down in a forward flexed position. And when we're in that position, it really exaggerates the weight of the head and puts a lot of strain on your neck and on your shoulder which can really exa um, exacerbate underlying arthritis issues and cause pain, pinched nerves, muscle tightness. So if you were to use one of the holders here, we see one for the, the cell phone and one for the tablet, then you can be having it at a, a raised angle so that you are not having to stare down so far and having your head in that poor position. 
if you're out and about and don't have the ability to be resting your phone or your tablet on a surface, then the other option is to be using uh, one of the pop sockets that you see in these pictures. Uh, the pop sockets are things that just stick on the back of your cell phone and either have the, the rounded plastic disc that you can pop out or a ring. Either way, it's going to give you something easier to hold on to instead of having to, to hold your phone uh, for a prolonged period of time in this widened grip, which can really aggravate hand pain and thumb pain. Whichever device you end up using, I think a key message is also that you need to take frequent breaks to not be holding it and texting for long periods of time and to be really aware of your posture while you're doing that. So those are just some recommendations for some of the different activities that we have to do on a daily basis. Thanks for that, Lisa. Uh, it does seem like many of our attendees, based on these questions, uh, have some green thumbs. So lots of questions came in about preventing pain in the hands and the back when people are gardening. So what are your thoughts on this? Mm -hmm. Definitely a very relevant question for this time of year. Uh, right now, there's lots of people who are busy out in their gardens and their lawns getting it ready for the summer. Uh, and that, unfortunately, can sometimes involve quite a bit of heavy work. We might be digging up old plants or shrubs, carrying heavy bags of soil, or just being bent over in, a, in that forward flex position for a long period of time. Uh, I think it's important that we learn to take frequent rest breaks or change the type of activity that we're doing to avoid being in one position for a prolonged period of time. That can certainly be frustrating for individuals who are used to doing a fair amount of work without having to stop. But it's really about kind of changing your mindset to recognize that if you are overusing your joints and pushing through on one day, that might translate into having increased pain and a decreased ability to do other activities for potentially several days afterwards. So instead of finding yourself in that situation, you can try splitting up activities uh, to change what type of work you're doing. So for instance, if you were starting by um, pruning some shrubs, that can involve a lot of gripping in the hand, a lot of repetitive gripping movement, which can aggravate the fingers and the thumb. Uh, so once you've done that for a little bit, if you notice your hand is starting to get a bit fatigued or starting to become sore, my advice would be that you, you walk away from that task and then you, you can do something that doesn't revolve around having a lot of repetitive gripping of the hands. Uh, so maybe that might be planting some flowers, maybe that's watering, weeding, adding mulch to gardens, but doing something without the repetitive hand gripping. Another good strategy is to try to avoid the heavy lifting when possible. Um, so for instance, if you are having a heavy bag of soil, instead of carrying that, certainly not carrying it in, your, in a grip in your hands, but even carrying it in your arms might be difficult. So using a wheelbarrow or some type of a wheeled cart is a good option. Or potentially you might be able to do it just in smaller loads where you bring individual pots to the bag of soil that you need to, to fill up. And in that sense, you're just gonna be doing a much lighter load. One other option to consider is whether or not it's possible to uh, switch to some raised flower beds. This might not work in every situation, but it certainly does reduce the amount of bending that you need to do. And it, that's gonna be helpful in the long run. Let's look at a couple of other options here. So a gardening kneeler stool, this is a really nice option uh, for people with back, hip or knee problems. Uh, if you feel as though you are able to, then you could flip it upside down and use it as a kneeling stool like you see on the right hand side. It then has this padded cushion for your knees. You're not all the way down on the ground, so it's a better angle for your ankles and your feet. And you then have those handbars that you can use to help push yourself back up into a seated position. If kneeling is not a possibility, your knees just do not bend that way and you wouldn't be able to get back up, then you can have it flipped the other way and it becomes a nice low stool that you can sit on. That's gonna reduce how much forward bending you have to do. And again, it's gonna have those handbars that you can hold on to to get yourself back up into a seated position. Another thing to look for is ergonomic gardening tools. Uh, on the left-hand side, we see an example of an ergonomic um, pruning shears. So you can see how it has a, a, a cutout section for the thumb so that the thumb doesn't have to be abducted really far out, causing more pain. But it's also got a nice, thick handle to hold on to with the fingers. Uh, plus it's spring-loaded, which means that you're not gonna have to put as much force through. 
with gardening shears, you definitely do want to make sure that you're keeping the blade sharp. Um, with gardening tools of any type, they, they get dirty, they get wet, they get rusty, and the blade can get quite dull over time. And when that happens, you're going to have to put a lot more force through that, that blade to be able to achieve the same task. So keeping a sharp blade is important. On the right hand side, we also see an example of other gardening tools where small shovels, trowels, different pieces of equipment can have that nice enlarged handle with a curved grip so that you have better alignment through your fingers. I also encourage people to think of doing things by using bigger or multiple joints. Uh, so we, we were talking about the pruning uh, shears, which requires a lot of gripping force through the hand. If that's not comfortable for you, you could also consider using something like a lopper. So a lopper, we often think of that as um, getting higher branches or thicker branches, but it can be used for smaller items too. And to do that, you would then be using more of your chest and shoulder muscles and wouldn't be relying so heavily on the small joints in your hands. Similarly, on the left-hand side, we see a picture of, of an upright weeder. So as opposed to being down on your hands and your knees and using a small device to dig out, say, dandelions, the, the upright weeders allow you to just use your body weight to press down on the pedal, pull the weed out of the garden, you can dump it in a bucket, and at the end, collect that yard waste to dispose of. So better posture, better alignment, and a lot less um, risk of injuring some of those joints. Thanks, Lisa. And some of those weeders work really well, I can attest to. Um, we've had some similar questions come in, um, but regarding physical activity and in particular golfing. So do you have any recommendations to minimize pain uh, when golfing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, another really relevant question for this time of year. Uh, a lot of people heading out onto the golf course this time of year. And I think one thing to consider is that a lot of individuals just tend to be a little bit more less physically active during the winter months, and they might experience some deconditioning. Uh, once the spring rolls around and you start golfing again, that might mean a sudden increase in the amount of physical activity that you're doing. A golf course is roughly about six kilometers long. So unless you've been in the habit of, of walking relatively long durations on a consistent basis through the winter months, that might be a really sudden increase in the amount of strain on your feet, your knees, your hips, and your back. Um, you wouldn't go from doing no physical activity to doing four straight hours in the gym. And we wouldn't recommend that you go from being quite sedentary through the winter months to uh, expecting your body to be able to walk for four hours straight. That's why we really encourage people to try to exercise year round to maintain their strength and their flexibility. Another consideration for golf, but, but I think really for any activity or hobby, um, is that sometimes we need to consider how much is too much or what's an appropriate amount uh, while still feeling our best. If you really enjoy golf and you want to be able to golf four times a week, but in reality, what you really need is a full day off in between each round of golf to allow your joints to, to rest and heal, then perhaps you need to consider golfing a little bit less frequently. Or perhaps you're able to golf that frequently, but instead of golfing 18 holes every time, you golf nine holes sometimes. I think it's important not to completely abandon hobbies and activities that we enjoy, um, especially ones that give us physical activity, but it's equally important to find ways to find a safe, modified version or, or perform it a little bit less frequently so that we're not causing ourselves undue pain or damaging our joints. With golf and with many other types of activities, gardening included, it's a good idea to do some stretching before you get out there. And I think a lot of golfers are, are aware that this is something that is important. Um, before an activity, we encourage people to do dynamic stretches. So dynamic stretches means that you're doing several repetitions, but not holding them for very long. Whereas at the end of an activity, once you're done, you might do static stretches where you're going to hold that stretch for a prolonged period of time but only do one or two repetitions. But before you get out on the golf course, you'll want to start by warming up the, the low back and the hamstrings. We can see on the left hand side the picture uh, that's called a, a good morning where uh, they're stretching out their low back and their hamstrings, making sure that they're starting to warm it up and get some increased circulation to those muscles. Um, we see some pictures where we're doing things like trunk rotation, some 
sometimes people do that while holding on to the golf club where they have it on their shoulders and they're they're twisting from side to side as long as you're not forcing it past your comfort range uh, and then also doing things to warm up our arms so the the wrists and the elbows they get a lot of work in golf and a lot of people can experience tennis elbow or golfer's elbow um, with that so doing things like stretching out the the wrist extensors and the wrist flexors making sure that those are warmed up before you get out on the golf course is important then there's the question of of how you are kind of traversing the golf course um, at first, sometimes when they're feeling uh, very energetic and healthy, they, they might want to carry their golf clubs. Um, when you have a, a bag full of your golf clubs, you're looking at approximately 18 pounds or more, depending on the type of bag that you have. Uh, when we're talking about our weight bearing joints, like our hips and our knees, we know that there's an exaggerated effect on those. So they say it's about four times your body weight on your knees and about three times your body weight on your hips. So by carrying a bag of, of golf clubs, you're looking at about an extra 72 pounds of force on your knees and about 54 pounds of force on your hips. You then carry that over six kilometers. That's a significant amount of additional strain on those joints. And if you're experiencing a lot of arthritis in their joints, that might be uh, not recommended, that that might be too much for those joints to be able to comfortably withstand. If that's the case, then you're better off using either a push or a pull cart. We generally accept that pushing is preferred to pulling. When we are pushing a cart, it's in line with our body and the forward moment, momentum created by our walking is going to be translating that energy straight into the wheels. So it's, it's a better conservation of energy and we've got better postural alignment when we are pushing a golf cart. When we're pulling a golf cart, we normally are in a rotated position, slightly rotated. We've got a shoulder in full extension and an elbow fully extended. So you're putting a lot of strain through your shoulder and your arm. And I think most golfers would prefer to be using that, that muscular energy and muscular force to accomplish their golf swing as opposed to dragging the cart behind the, the clubs behind them. If you've already made the transition, you're already using a push cart, but quite simply, walking a full 18 holes, regardless of whether you're pushing or pulling that by the end, you just have a lot of increased pain, then I think it's really worthwhile to consider using an, an electric or gas powered cart. Um, you're still going to be getting physical activity, you still have to walk in between the cart and the ball, there's still areas where you're not supposed to be bringing that cart. And you're still getting out there enjoying an activity that you love socializing, getting fresh air, lots of positives to it. And if you can comfortably do that without then being in pain that that night and the next day, then it's worthwhile. Another thing to consider is um, your club handles. So if your issue is that you have pain in your hands or decreased range of motion in your fingers that you can't make a full fist, then you should really consider getting enlarged club handles. We can see in this picture the difference in between a standard golf grip and an enlarged grip, where the enlarged grip, it does not require nearly as much flexion through the fingers so that somebody is able to much more comfortably hold on to that club if they don't have full flexion available. This is going to allow you to more comfortably hold on to the club and have a better swing because you won't be trying to have kind of that death grip on the club, which is detrimental to your golf swing. So just some things to consider there. That's great, Lisa. So we're going to come inside for a few minutes. So for those people who spend a lot of time in the kitchen cooking, baking, what tools are available that can make their cooking easier? Mm -hmm. I think the kitchen is an area where a lot of people notice difficulties first. Uh, and that's because we're, we're opening jars, we're chopping food, we're peeling, we're lifting heavy pots. We're doing all these activities that really do put quite a bit of strain on our hands. Um, so in addition to that, we also have to stand for long periods of time. And if you've got a lot of pain in your back or in your legs, that can be really problematic. Luckily, there are quite a few different options for assisted devices. It's just a matter of finding the right one for you. Right off the bat, I generally encourage people to um, consider a variety of jar openers since opening jars is one of the first things that people start to notice they have difficulty with. When you have a new jar, it's important that you break the seal on that jar or release the seal before you try to open up the lid, because that's going to right off the bat make it a whole lot easier. 
people usually have a variety of different methods that they use. Sometimes it can be banging the, the lid of the jar with the end of a knife, or sometimes it's banging the entire jar on a countertop or running it under hot water. Um, whatever strategy works for you is fine as long as you find that it's, it's effective and it doesn't cause you extra pain. If you haven't found a good way, or if you're looking for a new way, then you might wanna consider using a jar key. Um, so a jar key is just a little device that you stick underneath the, the rim of the lid and then you pop up and that's gonna release the seal on the jar, making it much easier for you to get into. Um, Lee Valley Tools makes a nice one if you happen to have a Lee Valley Tools where you live, or you can find these online as well. They're, they're the jar keys. Once you have popped the seal on the jar, um, you might find that that's good enough. You might be able to get into it, or you might still need some extra assistance. Uh, a, a good first step is to have some type of a non-slip grip pad. So this material here is an example of that. This is called Dysum, uh, and it's kind of this thick, rubbery kind of almost sticky type of material that lets you get a really good grip on the surface that you're trying to open um, with. So if you had a piece like this, you could just cut it in half. I leave it in my cutlery drawer to use whenever I need to. And you can have one piece on top of the lid, but you can also have another piece around the bottom of the lid so that you've got this really good grip and it's not going to slide out of your hands as you're trying to turn it. And that's going to reduce how much force you have to use. If that's not quite enough, if you feel like you still need a little bit more, there's a large variety of different jar openers out there. Some of them are this kind of wrench design. Um, so both of these have a similar type of style where they've got different sized openings for different jar lids. And the idea behind this is that you would, you would just open it up, you would put it over the lid, and then it's kind of got this, this longer lever handle that you can use to twist open the jar. Um, and you might still wanna use the Dysum in your other hand to hold the jar in place, uh, but then this can be useful for, for trying to get those difficult jars. Same type of design with this one. It's just, it's a metal one and it's got all these different sizes of openings that you can use for different jars. If you're not a big fan of the wrench design, if that doesn't seem to do it for you, then another option is this one, which is a V grip. So a V grip is, this one in particular is intended to actually be installed underneath the kitchen count cabinets. So you screw this in underneath your kitchen cabinets and that way once it's in place, it gives you the ability to use both of your hands on the jar to hold the jar, slide it into the V and then twist it until you're able to get it open. And so some people like that because that way they have two hands on the jar as opposed to having to hold things separately which can be difficult depending on your range of motion in your hands. Another issue that a lot of people have is just holding on to kitchen utensils in general, uh, whatever we're talking about, knives, uh, knives, peelers, cutlery, whatever it might be. One thing to look for in kitchenware is, is that enlarged non-slip handle. So just like what we were talking about with the golf clubs, where we wanted to have an enlarged handle so that we didn't have to make as tight a fist, we want to see that type of thing in our kitchenware as well, because it's going to make it a lot easier to hold on to. Here we have an example where we can compare two different spatulas. So one of the spatulas has a, a thin metal handle versus another one having this enlarged uh, plastic handle. So it's obviously going to require less range of motion and be more comfortable to hold on to this kind of ergonomically shaped enlarged handle than to have to have a nice a tight grip on this thin um, angular piece of metal. So those are little things that you can consider when you're, when you're looking for buying any of that type of kitchenware. If you don't have the enlarged handles, but you don't really want to have to go out and replace everything that you have, another option is to use foam pipe insulation. So foam pipe insulation, you can, you can buy this online, um, but you can also get it at hardware stores. And it comes in different diameters of openings. So the, the hole in the center would be of different sizes. This stuff is great to add to any handle. So it certainly can be used in the kitchen. Like let's say you have uh, a, your favorite wooden spoon, but again, that is a, a thin handle that requires a tight grip. 
So you could use something like the foam pipe insulation to just slide over the handle and you can cut it to whatever length you need. And then you now have this enlarged grip to be able to hold on to your favorite spoon. And then when you need to watch it, you just slide it back off. This can be used outside of the kitchen. You can use this on your toothbrush or on a pen or a pencil or whatever item it is that you need to just make a little bit bigger. I've even had clients use uh, much larger versions of these on paddles for kayaking or canoeing, something that they needed to have a nice and large handle that they get a big one and they can even just tape it on so that it stays in place. So kind of a nice little option to consider. Uh, another concern that sometimes people have is with blades. Um, it can be difficult cutting up food, chopping food, and what you can do around that. A traditional life is sometimes difficult to hold on to. So one option is to get a right angle knife. So a right angle knife, as you can see here, we've got this enlarged ergonomic handle that's vertical or mostly vertical while the blade runs horizontal. And what that's gonna accomplish, as we were talking about this in gardening, is you're now gonna be able to use bigger muscles to accomplish the task. So instead of having to have a tight grip on a knife where you're putting all of the force through your fingers and your thumbs and your wrists, you're now gonna be able to use your entire arm to do more of a, a sawing motion. So using bigger muscles um, and multiple joints to accomplish the task to make it easier. And one other little option here when it comes to blades, um, the same problem of knives, sometimes people have that same problem when it comes to using a peeler. This little guy is called a palm peeler. So a palm peeler has a little ring on the back. Some of them have two rings, some of them have one. And you would just slide that over your finger and it then has the blade through the palm of your hand. So now when you are peeling, instead of having to grip it in, in between your thumb and the rest of your fingers, you can just do kind of this sweeping motion so that you can peel the, the vegetable or the potato, whatever it is that you're working on. So making that a little bit easier to, to coordinate. Let's look at a couple more options here. So a couple of other options when it comes to openers, the, the ones on the left-hand side, those are, are basically kind of like a needle nose pliers or tongs. And those types of, of the small silver ones, um, are, they lock. So they've got like the little clips on it will lock into place. Those are great for the jars or bottles that have a seal over top of them. Those really annoying plastic seals that you're supposed to be able to grab onto and peel off bottles of ketchup, new bottles of vitamins, those types of things. That can be really difficult to get a very tight pinch grip on and peel off. But using those types of tongs, because they lock the place, you can lock them onto the edge of the label and then just use the entire tong to pull it off, making it quite a bit more comfortable and easier to get in those, those types of, of containers. The one on the right here is quite a handy little tool. They, they're often called either a five-in-one or a four-in-one tool. And they're really good when it comes to some of those small bottles. So I know a lot of people, they really struggle with, for instance, the small bottles of water that have those really thin plastic lids. And if you grab the bottle too hard, then all the water sprays out of it. So those can be a real nuisance to get into. So having just a small little bottle opener that works on those tiny caps can be really beneficial. Um, so this bottle, it can do that. But at the bottom of it, it also has a little slot that you can use to stick into the tab of a Pepsi can or, or a soda can to open up one of those cans or the little claws that you see at the end, those can also be used like a jar key that it can go underneath the rim of the, uh, of the lid to break the seal, um, or just a traditional bottle opener if you needed to get into to a, a beer bottle perhaps, maybe in the summer after golf. If you still find that all those types of traditional openers, they're, they're, they're not working it for you, you just, you really don't have adequate strength and range of motion in your hands, then I would say consider some of the electric and body, battery operated uh, suggestions out there. Um, so for instance, we see electric can openers, those tend to be quite effective and they're usually pretty durable. Um, we also have battery operated jar openers 
they, they're a little bit more hit and miss, truthfully speaking, that um, I find that some people find them a little bit slow, that they're not the fastest things. And sometimes people find that that can be frustrating. They do make fully electric jar openers that work quite well. They're just a little bit bigger. So it depends on whether or not you want to take up the room in your kitchen with the, that piece of equipment. And I'd also suggest that it's good to kind of change your mindset into whether or not you can do some of your meal preparation by using things like a food processor or maybe a mandolin where you can have a nice enlarged grip that that's holding on to those vegetables or different items and then you're just sliding it down the blade. Um, you do have to be quite careful though as mandolins are known for being very sharp and nobody wants to cut themselves on them. I, I also encourage people to try to work smarter, not harder. Um, pots are notoriously quite heavy, especially once they get filled with water and potatoes or rice or vegetables. When you're trying to pick up a pot, especially if it only has one handle, you might find that that's really putting a lot of pressure and pulling through your thumb and your wrist. Even if you're using two hands, you're still gonna experience a lot of strain. So I really encourage people to keep an oven mitt beside the oven and use that so that they can have one hand underneath the pot supporting it and keeping your wrist at a better alignment. Or if you don't want to pick it up, just use a slotted spoon to scoop out what you need out of the water into a separate bowl. And once that pot has completely cooled off, then you can use two hands to more comfortably pick up that pot and drain it in the sink. On the right hand side here, we also see uh, this oven rack hook. So not something that everybody knows about, but when we're dealing with the heavier things, large casserole dishes or uh, say a turkey or a roast chicken, um, it's not even just a matter of holding it that's the problem. It's the fact that you then have to hold it out in front of your body while you flex forward to stick it into the oven and to pull it back out. And that can be both very difficult, but also dangerous. So an oven rack hook allows you to actually just pull the entire rack out towards you so that although you're still holding that heavy item, you can keep it much closer to your body and you don't have to worry about bending forward and into the oven. And once you have put it down on the rack, you can then use that same stick to just push the rack back in and repeat that when you need to take it back out of the oven. So kind of a nice little option. And finally, what I would say is with the prolonged standing um, outside of, you know, all the issues that we can have with our hands, that prolonged standing can really be an issue for people who have any type of, of chronic or ongoing pain in their back or in their legs. Um, so a couple things to consider. One is your footwear. Uh, I really encourage people not to go barefoot in the house, especially when they're standing for prolonged periods of time doing cooking or cleaning. You would never go for a half hour walk barefoot or wearing, you know, just a really uh, thin pair of flip flops. And you wouldn't want to do that when you're in your house, when you're standing for long periods of time, potentially on a ceramic floor. So make sure you have a good pair of indoor shoes that are going to give you adequate support and cushioning. Um, aside from that, you can also use one of these anti-fatigue mats uh, or gel mats. They're, they're usually fairly easy to find. They sell them at Costco, Bed Bath & Beyond, and hardware stores. Uh, I've got one in my kitchen that I just keep in front of my sink and my cutting board so that when I'm doing the most of my kitchen work, I'm on that type of an anti-fatigue mat. If that's not enough of an option, if you really are limited in how long you can stand, then you could consider something along the lines of a perching stool. So a perching stool, as we see here, it allows you to have the back legs up a little bit higher than the front legs, so that you're kind of up on this high angle and can still be at a comfortable level at your kitchen sink or at your countertop. And that way you can um, change your position, that you can be standing for part of the time, but then sitting for part of the time to really be trying to protect your legs and your back. So lots of different things to consider, but fortunately lots of different options out there as well. So thank you for all that great advice, Lisa. Um, in particular, I'm happy that you showed that vertical knife because we've had a lot of questions uh, tonight about chopping carrots, and onions and things, so really, really relevant. Mm -hmm. um, before we get into some more of the Q&A from this evening, do you have any final thoughts or recommendations for our viewers? Uh, so I, I would say that with um, assistive devices, 
I don't want people to feel that they have to go out and just buy every product on the market. The assistive device should be appropriate for what you wanted to do. It, it, should, it should make your task easier. It should allow you to accomplish it with less pain. And it should allow you to remain independent in that task. So we don't want to just have to throw money away and end up with a drawer filled with clutter. Um, but when you're, when you're looking at those different devices, take a look at them and kind of ask yourself those questions. Is it going to make it easier? Is it going to reduce the pain? And will it allow me to remain independent in that task? And if the answer is yes, then I, I absolutely think that it's a great idea to use these types of devices. They're intended to protect your joints, avoid putting too much strain on them, which is really all about protecting that joint so that you're not getting excessive amounts of damage accumulating through the years. That's great. Um, so let's just dive in. Lots of questions here about braces. So uh, could you first start off by giving us a sense of what types of braces are available to help support people's joints? Yeah, there, there's a lot of different types of braces out there. Braces for pretty much every single type of the type of the body or part of the body, I should say, um, depending on what area you're struggling with. So, for instance, if your if your issue is that you're having problems with your hands, uh, whether that's in the kitchen, golfing, gardening, whatever the the, the area might be, uh, for some people, the issue with their hands in particular is pain at the base of their thumb. Uh, this is a a very common area for osteoarthritis. Uh, and a spot that can cause people a lot of pain and a lot of functional loss because of an inability to do a lot of opposition. So if that's something that you're experiencing, then I would encourage you to consider maybe using a thumb splint. So for instance, this is just an example of a thumb splint. This, this model in particular is called a comfort pool. This is a, a soft thumb splint, but there's lots of different ones out there. So it, it wraps around the hand and then it has this additional piece here that wraps around the base of your thumb and comes and attaches on the back to provide it with support. It's a nice option because it's a soft brace. It's not rigid. It doesn't have any metal stays in it. And so a lot of people find that it's comfortable, but the compression and the additional strap wrapping around it help to keep the base of the thumb in a good position so that you can do things like hold on to tools or utensils or your golf clubs uh, more comfortably without having so much pain because it's, it's keeping better alignment at that joint. So often a thumb brace can go a long way in maintaining independence. Another option for the hands is if, you, if you're having pain, but it's more at your wrist as opposed, to, um, as opposed to the fingers, then you might find that you benefit from a wrist brace. So a wrist brace is a little bit different. So a wrist brace looks like this. You'll notice that the thumb is not protected. So it's not going to do anything if you have arthritis at the base of the thumb. But if your problem is that you have maybe previously broken your wrist or you have weak wrists and that you have pain when you're lifting up pots or unloading the dishwasher, getting things down out of a cupboard, then having support on the wrist might allow you to do some of those lifting activities with less discomfort. So that's another nice option. For the lower half of the body, um, specifically we'll talk about the knees, lots of different options out there and, and knee braces vary greatly where knee braces can be anywhere from, you know, getting a $20 pair at the pharmacy to a $2,000 custom made brace. Um, when people are starting off, I often recommend something uh, kind of along this line where it's, it's basically like a compression sleeve. So you would pull this on over your knee. You see that it has a hole cut out for the kneecap. It's got kind of a, a flexible stays at the side to provide a little bit of additional support. But you can basically think of this as kind of like a tensor bandage, just keeping a little bit of compression around that knee, trying to help hold it into place, keep some warmth in, and, and increasing a little bit of what we call Called proprioception, which just means that it, it, it improves kind of the body's awareness of where that knee is and how you're moving it so that you're not accidentally twisting it or putting it down incorrectly. This is kind of a good starting spot, but the one complaint that people sometimes have is that it can slide down so that over time it starts to shift and it's not in position and it can be frustrating if people feel like they have to keep pulling it up. If that's the case, you might want to go up to kind of the next level 
which is uh, a still a similar idea, but it, it can Velcro shut of a, and below the knee. So still has that appearance of, of the knee brace. You're still sliding it through. It's got the hole for the, the kneecap, but it's got Velcro straps so that you have a little bit more control over how tight it is. So you've got a strap that you can do around the thigh, around the thigh, around the knee and around the calf so that you have a little bit more control over how tight that brace is being held in position and hopefully it doesn't uh, then slide around quite as much. I think those are pretty good starting ones. Uh, and then if you find them beneficial, but you feel like you need a little bit more support, you need something a little bit more high tech, maybe it has to have uh, more, more support or stays at the side, metal stays or hinged brace, then there's lots of options there that you can move your way up. But it, it's sometimes worthwhile just to try one of the less expensive ones to begin with and see whether or not that's even comfortable and if you like it. Um, yeah, yeah, so I think that those would all be some good braces to consider. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, what about people who are having difficulty with fine motor skills? And this one, this question is about the small vials that people often have to use when they're putting in eye drops. What recommendations do you have for people there? Yeah, that's a, a good question. So um, I actually put together a slide for that one. Let's see here. So this is a question that we do get uh, and, and is a common, I would say, you know, a relatively common concern that unfortunately, um, often the, the two problems coincide where it might be that the individual is dealing with things like glaucoma or cataracts and they have to deal with those tiny little bottles of eye drops, but they also have arthritis in their hands that makes squeezing these tiny little eye drops quite difficult. So there are a couple products on the market. Um, I just listed two of them here. Um, one of them, uh, OptiCare Arthro, where the bottle uh, goes into it. And then it's, it's almost like a pair of pliers that you can then squeeze. So you can then use your whole hand. It makes it easier. You don't have to have as much of a pinch grip. And then the one on the right hand side, the Ableware Auto Squeeze is another one that has a wider surface area. So although it's still a pinch, uh, it's a much wider surface area and that's gonna make it a little bit easier to hold on to. Another option that actually works for some people, um, depending on how much grip strength they have, is sometimes even just wrapping an elastic several times around that bottle or several elastics is going to widen the bottle enough and, and give it enough of kind of that grip that they're able to more easily uh, apply pressure and squeeze just by having the elastics wrapped on it. So that could even just be a first step to try out. Okay. Um, this is maybe a tricky one, but is there an aid to help people apply lotion to hard to reach places? Yes, so, so tricky, but, um, but certainly an issue that does come up uh, due to a variety of issues of, of whether that's dexterity in the hands or a lack of shoulder range of motion. So there are different products out there. I just, I, I took kind of a picture of just one of them. Um, this is called a roller lotion. So basically all of the designs are gonna be fairly similar where you're gonna have kind of a longer handle and on the end of it, you're gonna have an applicator um, where you can put, whether we're talking about a, a, a medicated cream, like trying to rub a prescription cream on your back, or if we're even just trying to talk about rubbing regular lotion on your skin because it can get dry and itchy, um, that using something like this can be a nice way to apply the lotion to those kind of hard, hard to reach places. Um, and this this product in particular, uh, I think I got this one from Bed Bath & Beyond, but if you look online, I think you'll find that they have lotion applicators in different stores uh, and probably even Amazon that you could take a look at. Okay. Um, what about people who are cleaning their homes or otherwise? Are there are there aids that can help uh, cleaning make cleaning easier? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, cleaning can be difficult for a variety of reasons. So for, for some people, cleaning is a problem with their back, uh, where, for instance, when we're talking about vacuuming or sweeping, the, the concern is that it is difficult to uh, be bending forward in a, in a full movement to be accomplishing that type of task, and that can cause them a lot of pain. Um, so sometimes it can be not even a necessarily about a different 
different device, but using a particular posture. So for instance, for vacuuming and sweeping, one of the things that we really encourage people to do is to be standing upright in, in a good, comfortable, uh, supported alignment in their posture. And when they're doing something like the vacuuming, that they are not doing big movements. So we discourage people from letting the vacuum get really far away from them or from twisting their body a lot from side to side. It's a matter of doing smaller movements, keeping that vacuum close to the body and trying to keep it in line with your body while you're doing that movement. It can also be beneficial to, to use a lighter weight product. Uh, so for instance, there are cordless vacuum cleaners that are available um, that, that actually can do it a decent job. Now they've kind of come a long way from what they used to be. Uh, so getting a cordless vacuum, it's gonna be a lot lighter, uh, which if you potentially have to be carrying it up and down stairs, that's a much better option than lugging this big, really heavy vacuum cleaner up and down the stairs. So something to consider for for that. Um, for, for other considerations for cleaning, there's several different things out there that can make it easier. So for instance, if you're talking uh, about difficulty when it comes to like wringing out dishcloths or wringing out a sponge, that's, that's often a concern that people do have, especially if they've got pain in their hands and that movement is painful. Um, one of the things that you can do is you can try to get as much of the water out as you can, but then if you were to drape the cloth over the faucet of the sink and kind of squeeze it in between your hands and run it down like that so that you're kind of trying to get as much of the extra water out of it as you can, then that's one way to, to try to get some of that extra water out. And then just leave it draped over the faucet so that it it's, can drip dry in that way. It might be useful that if you find that by using that technique, if it, it gets a little bit mustier because it doesn't get all the water out, then you might just invest in a couple of extra dishcloths and just change them on a more regular basis. So don't worry about the fact that they, they get a little bit musty or that they don't get quite as dry as you would like them to. At the end of every day, you can just throw it in the laundry room sink and get out a new one. Uh, and that way you don't have to worry so much about that. Um, Another option is if you find that it, it's quite painful to be even trying to do that, trying to do the wringing out, then you might want to consider using more like cleaning wipes. So for instance, Lysol wipes would be an example, although there's lots of other brands. But in, in the bathroom, in the kitchen, instead of spraying cleaner on the countertop, having a specific rag that you're using to clean it and then having to rinse that out, you could just be using a, a Lysol wipe to clean that countertop, clean the sinks, clean in the toilet and then it just gets thrown in the garbage can so you don't have to worry about twisting uh, that cloth or, or trying to rinse it out every time. Um, other things that sometimes people do is if you have a, a, a product that's in a container that has a really difficult trigger on it, that it's hard to squeeze that trigger, then sometimes I encourage people to even just get a, a, a different bottle. So you can even just get it from the dollar store or, or a hardware store, get a bottle that has an easier, larger trigger on it and just dump that cleaning product into the, the other bottle, something that's easier for you to hold on to so that it's not quite so painful. Um, you might also in that circumstance feel that it's beneficial for you sometimes to even wrap that elastic again a few times around that trigger because having that non-slip surface might make it easier for you to hold on to and be able to more comfortably do that squeezing motion. That's great. Um, a, a few follow-up questions here about braces, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Should people be wearing them all the time or just when they're actually mobile? So for example, should you be wearing a knee brace uh, only when you're walking? Yeah, I, I think it does depend on the severity of the person's pain. But for, for knee pain, I usually recommend that people are using it specifically when they are mobile or performing a specific activity. So if you know that you are going to be up on your feet for several hours because you're going to the grocery store and you're doing some meal preparation and you're doing some cleaning, then I would put it on ahead of time and leave it on for the duration of that. But then once you've finished, I think that it, it's reasonable, you know, have a chance to sit down 
take that rest break, take the brace off. It probably feels good to kind of let the air get to your skin. Um, and, and same if you were doing a specific sport or going for a walk, then I would put it on prior to that activity, but you don't necessarily need to keep it on for the entire day. For the wrist and the thumbs, those can be a little bit different um, because sometimes people are just having a continual resting level of pain, especially if they're in a bit of an arthritis flare where they're just having a lot of pain and potentially it might even be keeping them awake at night because they're just getting this kind of dull throbbing pain. If that's the case, sometimes my clients do wear their brace to sleep at night. So they might find that by wearing something like this on their hand, even at nighttime while they're sleeping, it just seems as though it keeps it in a better alignment. It gives it some support and that that reduces pain enough to allow them to sleep more comfortably at night. I don't have any problem with that. I, I'm not sure that that's something that you need to do on a constant basis, but certainly if you find that something has happened to cause an aggravation or a flare up of the pain in that area, then there's nothing wrong with wearing one of those braces until things seem to kind of settle back down again. Okay. Um, quite a lot of interest in this sock aid that you presented earlier. Could you elaborate a little bit about how that works? And also some questions about what if you have trouble getting the sock around the device. Mm. Okay, um, I'm just taking a quick peek to see if I actually have a sock aid here with me that I could show you. And I do, okay, so sorry about that. So if you if you do have a sock aid, so this one is a pre-molded one. They're not all pre-molded, but this one is. If you have a pre-molded one, then what I do usually recommend doing is holding this in between your thighs. So I would put the base in between your thighs so that it's sticking up. And that way, what you can do is you have both of your hands free to be able to then try to use the sock, uh, stretch it out. You can use your thighs to squeeze it together, stretch it out and try to pull it over. If you find that that's difficult, then uh, one option is to get diabetic socks because diabetic socks, typically they have a, um, a, a much looser elastic around the ankle. So they're not going to be nearly as tight. So I would certainly recommend doing that. I've even had some clients who due to um, swelling, fluid retention in their ankles, they've even kind of made a little snip around the top band of their socks so that they're not so tight. Um, so you, you might find that you have to do something like that. But yeah, my, my recommendation would be whether it's pre-molded or just a flexible piece of plastic, hold it in between your thighs and kind of squeeze that together as tightly as you can so it's nice and snug. And then use both of your hands to try to open up that and pull it down. For things like compression stockings, which are notoriously difficult to get on and off, they do make what they call um, donning and doffing gloves, which are basically gloves that have uh, kind of a, a real almost they're almost like dish gloves that they have a real kind of almost grippy stickiness to them to allow you to to kind of hold on to that and pull them. Um, Compression gloves are, are very difficult, but the donning and duffing gloves, you might even consider that that could be used even just for a normal sock to get on and off of a sock aid. Perfect. Thank you, Lisa. I think we might have time for one last question, so I'll try to maybe lump a few together, but sure. quite a few more questions about fine motor skills and how to overcome some challenges there. So whether it's um, taking batteries in and out, uh, closing Ziploc bags, putting in earrings, things like that. So any sort of final advice recommendations you could give to people hmm. who are struggling there? Yeah, so uh, earrings are earrings are difficult. Earrings are tricky. Um, my recommendation for earrings is usually a couple of things. If it's possible, then I encourage people to switch to a hoop uh, so that they don't have to fiddle with the post at the back. If you do have earrings with posts that you really don't want to have to get rid of, then they do make posts that have kind of the enlarged uh, clear plastic circle on the back, which at least gives you a little bit more to hold on to. Um, or there are options to do things like using clip-ons or magnetic earrings. Um, but certainly, you know, I think anything that involves that really fine motor skill can be difficult. Similarly, necklaces, uh, the clasp on a necklace can be difficult. They do make attachments that have magnetic ends to them. So you can uh, attach these magnetic ends to the existing clasp of your necklace. And that way, instead of having to open and close that, you just, you just snap it together and pull it apart because it's just a magnet keeping it together. Um, 
um, oh, Ziploc bags. Ziploc bags. Uh, so two things about Ziploc bags. One is that we encourage people to try to use a proper C or O grip like this. So a lot of us, we get a little bit lazy and we do kind of more like a side squish where you're, you're squishing your... Um, your thumb and your index finger together. And when we do that, you can see how the bone at the bottom of my thumb, it really kind of juts out when I do that. It's really poor alignment. Whereas if I actually um, properly touch my thumb to my fingertip and create this O, then my bone is kind of back in that proper alignment and it significantly reduces how much stress you're putting through the joint. So Ziploc bags, I really encourage people to try to get into the habit of using a proper pinch grip when they're doing any of those types of activities, whether it's a Ziploc bag or a zipper, different things like that. If you really can't because of pain, then one way to do it is just to put the Ziploc bag down flat on the tabletop and use the, the side of your hand or the palm of your hand to just kind of squish it and push push down along the zipper to try to get it to catch that way. Uh, but see if you can do it with the pinch grip. If you can't, that would be a perfect example of when using a thumb splint might be beneficial because maybe by having a brace on that hand, you might have good enough alignment and support that you are able to use that Ziploc bag. That's so great, um, Lisa. So thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with us today. Such practical advice, really, really appreciative. Um, we would like to take a few moments to get the audience's feedback on today's presentation. So for those of you watching on the Zoom, you will see a poll question come up on your screen with some answer options. So click on the response that does reflect your thoughts. So quite simply, I feel more knowledgeable and empowered after attending this webinar. Agree, strongly agree, et cetera. We will also be sending you an evaluation form when we email the recording. So if you weren't able to access the poll question, you'll have the opportunity to provide your feedback there. So please do so. Um, we use the survey feedback to shape this series and uh, shape future Arthritis Talks webinars. So we really truly value your input. Once again, we are grateful to our partners, Pfizer and United Way Winnipeg for their support of this event. Our next webinar, Arthritis Talks, anti-inflammatory arthritis-friendly eating is coming up on Monday, June 27th. To register for that event, please visit arthritis.ca slash arthritis talks. This concludes Arthritis Talks, Assistive Devices for Arthritis. On behalf of all of us, thank you so much for joining us today. Please stay well.